Good morning, River City. Wow, you guys need to wake up. <laughs> Good morning, River City. Okay, okay, the few of you that are actually in here on time, I appreciate you and your timeliness. Would you stand to, with us as we worship together this morning? Father God, we are so grateful to be in your presence here, Father. God, we invite you in. Jesus, our heart is that you would be honored and glorified in our songs, in our worship. Jesus, we love you. This is all for you. We gather together here in your name.
are worthy. Lord, we believe that this morning. We declare it. Lord, you are so good. We love you, Lord. Be magnified in this place. Yeah. 
Nothing else but you. to be in your presence, Father. You're all we want. Restore, healer. You're all we want. You bring restoration. You bring restoration. To my soul, you've taken my pain, and you call me by a new name. You've taken my in his place you give me joy Lord you've taken my pain thank you Lord and you call me by your new name you've taken my
We're so thankful. On uh, May 26, I emailed our regular tenders and our members on some financial challenges that River City's walking through. If you didn't get it, uh, check your junk mail or wherever you send all the mail from me. Okay, just, I, I feel it. I feel you. <clears throat> but I want to take some time and pray. I want to take some time and pray. And because uh, one of the interesting things about financial challenges is, is I've seen God work and do miraculous things and build our faith every single time. And I know some of you may be experiencing financial challenges in just, you know, in this current economy and the way things are. So I want to pray. I want to pray for this fellowship. I want to pray for these families. And I want to pray for the Lord to continue. He has been so gracious. He always provides. But I want to pray for him to continue. And I want to pray for him to pour out blessing as we faithfully steward the things that he puts in our hands. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this fellowship. I just thank you for your hand, for the vision that you've given. Lord, we are so grateful for you. Lord, I pray for River City and the ministries associated with River City, and I just pray that you would meet every need. We ask. You told us to ask. You said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to us. And you're talking about food, clothes, the things we need. Well, Lord, if there's any area where our heart is seeking other things, I pray that right now you would realign us, that you would refine, refocus our vision, our mission. Let our eyes be clearly on you. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Jesus, I just pray that you would meet every need, financial, leadership, wisdom. 
I ask, Lord, that you would provide for this fellowship. I pray that you would abundantly pour out blessing. You use the phrase in Scripture for those who tithe. You said, open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings so that it can't be contained. Well, Lord, we want to be faithful stewards, and we want to experience your blessing like that. I pray for the families of this fellowship. I ask that you would bless each home. Lord Jesus, we all have needs. And I pray, Lord, that you would multiply the resources in the hands of this fellowship. I just pray that you would bless these families. I pray that you would bless us so that we can be a blessing. I pray that you would give us an open hand, an open hand that's open to receive, but an open hand that's open to give. Lord, we love you and we worship you. And let this time build our faith. I ask for testimonies in families. I ask for testimonies for this fellowship that we would begin to say, remember when and remember what God did and that that would transform us. Lord, we love you and we worship you. Pray for any other needs that are here represented here. I just pray for your blessing. I pray for your wisdom, your strength. I pray for healing of relationships. I pray for physical healing. Jesus, you are our fortress and our strength. We abide in you. We rest in you. And it's in that spirit that we ask. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Isn't the Lord good? Thank you, worship team. Bless you guys. Look, you're not even being seated because you think I'm going to head fake you. No, actually, at this point, you can be seated. While you stand, check out what's on the screens. Hey River River City, City. I'm Pastor Timmy and I'm Pastor Jacob and today is a big day for our Next Gen Ministries for a couple of reasons actually. First, it's Upgrade Weekend which means that kids of all ages are moving up to their next age or grade level. This means new classrooms, new small groups and for some a whole new ministry. Fifth graders moving into junior high, eighth graders heading to high school and twelfth graders, well, That's the second reason why today is a big day. We are recognizing and sending off our graduating high school seniors. It's a bittersweet moment for sure. We adore these young adults and are so sad to see them leave next gen. But we are so excited for what God has in store for them in this new exciting season of life. And one more thing that we need to cover before we head out, VBS, Vacation Bible School. It's a big deal around here at River City, and it's coming up on July 17th through the 21st. Kids three years old through incoming fifth graders will navigate through the Bible with interactive games, music, experiments, learning, and seeing what all of the heavens declare the glory of God. And so do we. So what does that mean for you? As a River City attender, a couple of things actually. First, you gotta register your kids. In fact, fill up your entire car with neighborhood kids, cousins, grandkids, nieces, nephews, classmates, anything, any child in your sphere of influence needs to experience the good news of the gospel. (laughs) Number two, volunteer. It takes a lot of engaged adults and teenagers to make VBS a successful and impactful week for the hundreds of kids that are coming to experience Jesus. And we need your help. So you can help out by donating some of the needed items hanging out in the foyer. So come by after service and see how you can get involved. Uh, I think we're supposed to tag out now. What does that even mean? Uh, Just follow me. (laughs) Hey River City, I'm Pastor Jonathan. And I'm Pastor Isaac. And we've got just a couple more things for you. First, we'll address the elephant in the room. Well, maybe it's not in the room yet, but it's about to be. A couple of weeks ago, we introduced a new marriage ministry that is starting this week. Summer Marriage Quickies. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me explain. Reengage has been our primary marriage ministry at River City, which is a 16-week commitment. That's long. Summer Marriage Quickies is only a four-week commitment Better. that is designed to provide a simple, painless, and even quick opportunities to connect and grow in your marriage. And yes, we had a bit of fun with the name, but hey, it's all about the marriage. We've partnered with a local nearby restaurant to provide a discounted meal for you. We're providing very affordable childcare and we'll even launch the evening conversation together to give some focus and direction before heading to date night. Date night. 
Tomorrow night is week one and there is still room to sign up. Although there is a caveat for childcare and registration deadlines that I'd be happy to discuss with you when you come talk to me in the foyer. Regardless, give your marriage a boost this summer and don't miss out on summer marriage quickies. Okay, last thing, here at River City, we are all about seeing more people living real life by passionately following Jesus. And we want to hear about your journey to real life. We will be collecting real life stories during the month of June. We want to hear how God has used the ministry of River City to impact your life. You can write it, you can type it, or you can say it right out in the foyer. We want to collect as many stories as possible, so please take a few minutes, one of these June Sundays, to come and share your story with us. Well, we've been here long enough, River City. We love you, and we will see you later. Peace. All right. Man, I wish I could like teleport like that. Wouldn't that be awesome? Like you just get wherever you want to go. Beach. Ah, didn't work. Oh, but hey guys, I am Jamie McGuire. I'm a pastor of our Next Gen Ministries, and today is Senior Sunday. Yes. I've had a couple people ask me what kind of seniors because they're like, hey, what kind of, what, what, do I get something special? Senior Sunday is every Sunday if you are over the age of 20, just saying. Uh, because you guys are here, it's awesome. But this is our graduating class of 2023 seniors. And um, what we're going to do is if, if you were here a few weeks ago for our baby dedication, it's something entirely different, but somehow so similar. We bless the parents. We say to, as a congregation, that we're going to help these parents to raise these children to love and to serve the Lord. And here we are a few weeks later, or 18 years later, and we get to see the fruit of those prayers of the many families who have walked with um, us at a, as a church or other churches that they've moved all through their lives. And now we have these adults that we cannot wait to stand in ministry shoulder to shoulder to bring the gospel to the entire world. And so, um, dang it. Everybody teases me because they, um, they know I love these kids and I love this church and it gets me every time. Um, but we're going to welcome these uh, young adults, my brothers and sisters in Christ, up to the stage as we pray for them and we launch them into their ministries, into the next calling that God has for them, into their next workforce decisions, into this next phase of their lives. Um, I also want to introduce to you Richard Ogren. And Richard, you can come out on the stage. And I want to introduce to you... Maria Legier. And these two people are awesome because they have been the small group leaders for our seniors this year and many years before. Um, and so they have prayed for, they have invested in, they have gone out to lunch and dinners, they have um, walked through Bible studies, they've sat through camps where they had only two hours of sleep a night while the kids were running around trying to get Richard to stay up later. And um, it didn't work. Richard, <laughs> Richard can sleep through anything. Um, but they have been um, instrumental in the lives of these young men and women. And also we want to invite to the stage Clay Burkholder, who is our youth pastor. And each of these will be praying for our seniors today. Um, Clay has been walking alongside uh, these young men and women, getting them ready. Uh, Clay is specifically specifically great at next year's education. He's got background um, in uh, college development, and so it's been a great year to have Clay with us. All right, so without further ado, Haley Bright, come on over here. <laughs> Haley. Haley. Um, is super excited to attend San Antonio College, and she has recently decided that she's going to be pursuing ministry and maybe missions, and so we're really excited for Haley. So awesome. Way to go, girl. All right, next up, I have Tucker Conant. Come on up, Tuck. Tucker. Tucker is going on to Arizona to Grand Canyon University to study education, so we're super proud of him. Destiny Davila. Woo. Destiny is going to Texas State University. Oh, this one. She's going to Texas State University, and she plans to study secondary special education and administration. So we're so excited for that. Come on out to the stage, Caleb Logan. Caleb. He's tall. 
I can get under his shoulder. Caleb is uh, excited to go on to the University of the Incarnate Word, and he plans to study international business, so I can't wait to see that. That's exciting. Um, and so we are so excited for Caleb and all that God's going to be doing in his life. All right. Next up, we have Easton McGuire. Come on over, Easton. This is the one I can say that I was present for his baby dedication. So, <laughs> Easton is going on to the United States Air Force Academy, where he'll be studying engineering and aviation. And so we're so excited for him. Uh, next up, we have Nicholas Pisano. Nicholas, come on up. Come stand here right next to Easton. Nicholas is going on to UTSA to study chemical engineering. Yes. All right. Come on out here, Tucker Shoemaker. All right. Tucker plans to pursue a career in welding and metalwork, and we cannot wait to see, because, like, I can't wait to see you helping out maybe here uh, in our welding at our vocational training institute. Would that be awesome? I'm not, like, laying that in there too heavy, am I? <laughs> we love having Tucker here. All right. I'm going to have you guys all take one step left. There we go. I'm going to welcome to the stage Miranda Stevens. Come on out, Miranda. Miranda. Love you guys. Miranda is going to be attending the University of Texas at Austin to study business and to continue to pursue her acting career. That's awesome. All right, all right. And next up, I have Gavin Usher. Gavin, come on up to the stage. Gavin is going to be pursuing um, technology and welding, and uh, we can't wait to see what's going to be going on for Gavin in the future. Now, y'all, um, I got to be part of children's ministry starting in, when these guys were in the fourth grade. And so um, I, I just like to highlight the fact that this is not their parents' church. Some of these kids who are now adults, found us just in the last few years, but they jumped in and created relationships. They bonded with their small group leader. I think as they look at one another, they look at each other as brothers and sisters, as people that you have stories with, of people you have bonded with, and um, I'm just so proud of them. Uh, we have people who here who have volunteered um, with three-year-olds for the past eight years. We've had um, some of these students have been at every child care event taking care of your kids. They have been at every special event, either on the stage or behind the scenes. They play on the worship team. Um, this is their church. And uh, this, is, this can be a transition that's super hard, right? Um, we've lived through it. This can be a transition where you feel alone. And I just want to say to each of you that if you ever have a moment where you feel alone, I want you to remember this picture here because these people love you, we love you, your group leaders love you, you can come home here anytime, and actually I hope that you never leave, you'll just be here next week, and the week after, and the week after, and, and here on Wednesdays, and, and, and in small groups on Thursdays, for those of you who are traveling away, I want to say to you the most important thing, some people will say get there early, get your classes, get your apartments, when you're going into your job interviews, you know, crush that. But what I want to tell you is to find your Christian community first. Because, and I probably don't have to tell you this, because we've been programming you, right? No, just kidding. We're not programming anybody. But if, if you can find the people to walk along your side and point you to Jesus, then you will be able to find him at any moment. In those moments where you feel alone, when you feel like God is not there, if you have Christian community around you, you will know it, you will feel it, and they will lead you back to him. You need to be in the word, you need to be praying, but sometimes those things are far from your mind and heart, and you need your brother and sister next to you, you need your church, wherever that may be, you need it every week so that you can walk with the Lord and lead his people. And I, I just want to pray for you guys. Um, I'm going to invite um, Pastor Clay, we're going to invite Maria, we're going to invite Richard to lay hands on these guys. We're going to invite you to extend your hand and to, to not just pray today, but commit to praying and remembering them. And when you see them, they're going to grow, they're going to look different. Um, but what we're going to do is always be their family. Uh, I know that Mary was pondering things in her heart. And at the end of Luke two, chapter 2, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom 
and knowledge and favor with man and God. But right before that, it was Mary pondered all the things that God had spoken to her about Jesus, and she held on to those things in her heart. And so we ponder those things for you all. We pray for God's wisdom, his knowledge, his favor on you for both him and this world as you go and conquer. And so we lift these kids up. In the name of Jesus, Father God, Lord, we just seal these young men and women and all of their desires and all of their passions under the name of Jesus. Lord, you have called them your own. Father, you have brought them to you in salvation. And Father, they have given themselves to you. And Lord, we just seal that in the name of Jesus. This world will never, ever steal that away from them. And Lord, in moments where they feel alone, I ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would scream loudly into them, I am your father and I am here and I am going to give you your family. And Lord, I just ask, Father, that you would give them prosperity, not the type of prosperity that the world values, but your prosperity. Prosperity full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. All of those things, God, I ask that those would be in and through them, Father, that they would operate in those things, that they would steward your spirit well, and Father, that they would not be afraid to go into all the world, Father, Every step, knowing that you are in front of them, you are next to them, and you are behind them. Father, we pray, Lord Jesus, that they would never walk away from you and that you would never allow them to. And so, Father, they will go into all the world. They will preach the gospel to all nations. They will baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, Lord, they will know you, they will enjoy you, and they will bring you glory forever. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. You are awesome. High fives. All right. Yes. Woo. And then we're going to be able to uh, give hugs and love on them um, after service today in the cabana over there. There will be pictures and gifts for you all. So thank you guys so much. We bless you in Jesus' name. Oh, man. Sorry. I love those kids. They're not kids, though. They're adults. But uh, there's people next to you here today that you may not have met before, and then we are a family. If you saw anything just now, we are a family. So go ahead and say hello to the people next to you. Give them a hug. Tell them I'm so glad to be here enjoying church together with you today. Well, good morning. I know I'm a little bit shorter than the normal people that are up here. Um, a, little, a little hairier in the face. So if you don't know, uh, I am Pastor Clay. I am with our amazing high school ministry who has already made themselves known. Um, good morning. I, I am super excited to get to bring you the word this morning. I, I think the Lord has laid something awesome on my heart. Um, And and I really feel that this sermon series, Outside the Circle, has some great opportunities for us to experience and see perspectives outside of maybe what we normally look at in church. And so, if you haven't guessed yet, uh, my perspective is River City Youth. Um, This is actually a special Sunday for Whitney and I. This is our one-year anniversary here at River City. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And it feels like in one year we have gone from strange Ohio people to absolute family with all of you. You have welcomed us with open arms. You have made us feel like we belong. And we have gotten to sow so much into these amazing students that you let us minister to uh, and and just belong. And and last week, Sean said, this series could also be called, um, I didn't know as much as I thought I knew. That's this past year, yep, okay, um, yeah, pretty much. You know, I, I've gotten education, I've done the research and spent the time reading. Um, if you're a military person, you know that the second you put boots on the ground, everything changes, right? You can do all the preparation, you can do all the schoolwork, but the second the application and the experience actually comes, everything changes, 
And we just talked about our amazing grads who are going off and, and doing all sorts of incredible things, right? It, it's kind of like college. It doesn't matter how much time you spend researching your college and doing your major research, right? It doesn't matter how many clubs you've decided that you're going to start up in your first semester and completely overwhelm yourself, and then you're like, I don't get it. Why am I so overwhelmed? All of the testing, all of the things, once you hit that college campus for the first time, it all changes. And if, if you're not concrete, if you're not solid in your faith, it's so easy for transitions, no matter whether it's college or regular old adulting or whatever it is, it can be easy for transition to be scary, for difficult circumstances to make our faith waver. But I think the Lord has blessed us with something, and, and I think this something is built into the DNA of River City. And that thing is discipleship. Discipleship, more people living real life by passionately following Jesus. It's not just a tag that we say because it sounds cool, right? We don't just put it all over the place and regularly remind you of that thing, right? We don't just say it to say it. More people living real life by passionately following Jesus is what discipleship is all about. And yet we face a disconnect. I think River City does an incredible job of discipleship. But as a church, as an American church, I think we are facing a difficult circumstance. We have a disconnect between discipleship and who we are as believers. I want to share some statistics with you this morning. The Barna Research Group, right, we've mentioned them before. They conducted a study of young adults in the American church. For a little bit of context, right, all of these young adults were raised in the church. They are church kids. They were there on the Sundays and the Wednesdays, and they were involved in the activities and in the events that go on at a regular church. Do you want to know the percent of those young adults that end up leaving the church in the first year? 64%. 64%. That's almost two-thirds of young people who are raised in the church. These are not unchurched young people. Raised in the church are walking away the second they leave home. And there's all sorts of reasons that they listed, whether it's hypocrisy or mistrust, lack of investment or disunity. All of these reasons are listed as some of the top. And and, and I think it can be easy to just kind of brush this under the rug and say, well, it's a young people problem, right? Young people are just lazy. Young people, they're just self-absorbed and they don't get it. Young people just don't have the same values that we have. But in the most recent census in the United States, a quarter of Americans are now considering themselves religiously unaffiliated. Quarter doesn't sound super scary until you realize it's 81 million people, okay? 81 million people. What we're seeing is the steady decline of Christianity in America and the steady increase of religious unaffiliation in other religious beliefs. And in the church, honestly, (laughs) we're not doing a whole lot better, okay? So the Barna Research Group, same group from before, conducted a study of church attendance. They found that only 24% of American Christians are regularly attending church. You want to guess how frequent regular attendance is at church, according to this study? Once a month. Once a month, 24% of American Christians are attending church. That's 12 times throughout the year that people find themselves in a church building that label themselves as Christians. And the, the reality is, if we don't talk about discipleship, if we don't talk about what it really means to be a disciple, we are going to see those statistics that are scary increase. We're going to continue to not solve the problem effectively. And what we're going to end up with is more and more young people, both in and outside of our circle, walking away. If you have your Bible, I'd like you to turn to Matthew 16. That's where we're going to park this morning. Um, Here, we kind of zoom in on this amazing conversation between Jesus and his disciples. So Matthew 16, before we get there, let me just pray for us. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much for your word. I thank you for its inspiration. I thank you for its truth. 
God, I pray that you would illuminate your word this morning for me and for this incredible congregation. God, I just pray that you would bless us this morning, um, that you would just keep us safe and, and, and remind us that you are over everything. We love you and we worship you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So, Matthew 16, starting in verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. I'm going to pause really quick, okay? As I mentioned earlier, Winnie and I are from Ohio. If you've ever been there, you've probably heard of the Ohio State Buckeyes, okay? Yeah, somebody gets it, right? Uh, OH, right? Yes, sir. All right. So my family, they are, are humongous fans of the Buckeyes. I don't care about sports. I'm just being honest. Sorry to disappoint half of you. Um, I don't care, but they do. And you know it's Buckeye season, right? Because the living room is full of screaming. Half of the time it's anger. Half the time it's celebration. I never really know where... Right? There's like these bowl games that happen, and we try and get into them, and we get really mad when it doesn't work out. Anyways, right? they buy the merch. Right? They, they rock the jerseys. They've got the t-shirts. They've got it all. And they are humongous fans of the Buckeyes. But Jesus, when he calls us to be disciples, that word disciple, whoever wants to be my disciple, that word in Greek is methetes. That word does not mean being a fan. That word does not mean buy all the merch that the church offers, sit on the sidelines and watch everybody else do the ministry, right? It doesn't mean watch as the world goes by. You see, the difference between being a fan, a a couch quarterback, of watching the game, and what Jesus is talking about is Jesus is calling us to be a part of this. We don't, as Christians, get the option of just sitting and watching and waiting as the game is played and cheering some people on and booing some other people while we do it. Christ is directly calling us to participate actively. He's calling you to be an invested disciple. It implies more than a fan. It means spending your time, spending your passion, your energy, your everything God has given to you into Christianity. Picking up in verse 25. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet to forfeit their soul? Or can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Now, this morning, I started off with some pretty awful statistics. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to start off in a bad mood, okay? It's about to get better, I promise. So in the same study that found that 64% of young adults raised in the church are leaving the church, there was an outlier, right? Uh, This little sect of, of young adults who were found to not leave. In fact, instead of just staying and, and watching the church function, there was 20% that the study found, who were investing back into the church, who were pouring their time and energies back into the church. The study labeled these young people resilient disciples. These resilient disciples were not fans of the church. They weren't sidelined, right? They were invested, committed, resilient disciples. And resiliency that ability to endure difficult circumstance, to remain strong through things that should tear you apart, I think this is what Jesus' words in Matthew 16 are all about. What we have to understand is that discipleship is what makes the difference between a strong and a weak circle. You want to know the difference between an effective ministry and one that doesn't reach people? It's discipleship. You want to know what took 12 men from different backgrounds in different areas and turn them into a team following the Son of God, it's discipleship. You want to know what took a fisherman off of his boat and turned him into the rock that the church was built upon? It's discipleship. You want to know what took a Pharisee who spent his time hunting and killing Christians and turned that man into an apostle for Jesus Christ? 
It's discipleship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote that salvation without discipleship is cheap grace. Family, if you do not hear anything else from me this morning, if you hear nothing else, I want you to hear that to truly influence others outside of our circle, we must be and we must build resilient disciples. I'll say it again. To truly influence others outside of our circle, we must be and we must build resilient disciples. And that starts with my first point for this morning. Number one, being a resilient disciple means denying yourself. Verse 24 of Matthew 16, we just read it. It says, whoever wants to be my disciple must what? Deny themselves. I don't know if you've noticed, but the world is built on the exact opposite idea of this, okay? The world wants you to crave the things that they tell you are worth craving, And the younger generations in the room are facing it more than ever, right? The mindless scrolling, the instant gratification, the the algorithms that have identified that the, the young adult attention span is anywhere between 10 and 30 seconds. That's it. That's all you got, right? We, we have social media influencers who have created an entire life based on a, a platform of technology that looks like absolute perfection. And to top it all off, we're told, love yourself, right? Doesn't matter what kind of discipline and love you may need. It doesn't matter about accountability or becoming more like Christ. No, just love yourself the way you are and it'll all be okay. And, and the world wants us to fulfill these desires, right? It's kind of the American dream, if we're honest, right? The, the idea of success that we're told that one day, eventually, at some point in the future, maybe we'll hopefully be happy when we've accumulated enough stuff, when we have enough money in the bank, when we don't have to worry about it anymore. The thing that just blows my mind is that in the most connected age the world has ever seen, we are more disconnected from one another than we've ever been. And sure, maybe it's because we haven't reported on anxiety and depression and other things before, right? But those rates are higher than they have ever been. Living for ourselves has led us in the exact opposite direction of loving God, in the exact opposite direction of loving one another, and the exact opposite direction of truly understanding what it means to love ourselves the way Christ has called us to. I don't think it's really a surprise that Jesus puts denying ourselves first when it comes to discipleship. It's because the biggest obstacle to effective, resilient discipleship is us. Jesus gave us a call, a call to be disciples. If you are in this room and, and you want to influence people both inside and outside of your circle, the first step is being a resilient disciple. And that's hard. I get the idea of denying yourself as difficult. Because when you deny yourself, it means that you have to take someone else's desire and place it above your own. And the world doesn't really like that, right? It's all about you. It's all about what you want. It's all about pushing and promoting yourself. And what Jesus calls us to do is to make less of ourselves, to deny ourselves and follow him, to obey someone else's plan for our lives, to obey someone else's plan for our finances, for our purpose, for our meaning, for everything. It's trusting someone else more than ourselves, and that's hard. And you know why I know it's hard? Because I had to struggle with the same thing. I know some of you will be shocked. Ministry was not on my top 10 list of things to do as an adult, okay? Um, And I grew up in church. I went every Sunday. And yes, we had Sunday night service, so I went every Sunday night, okay? And every Wednesday, and three times during the week, and I was in every ministry, and I was participating, but I didn't get it because I didn't understand the concept of denying myself, 
I was so focused on this idea of what success looked like, right? Maybe I'll be successful if people like me enough. If I am popular enough, right, I'll be fine. If I make enough money, I'll be good. I'll get the cool house and the cool car I've always wanted and the dog I've always wanted. If any of you have met our dog, Casey, she is not the dog I wanted, but... <laughs> She is ours nonetheless, okay? Still a blessing, right? Um, and, and I told myself that this is what success means to me. And so, despite having a calling on my life, despite having wrestled with this idea of going into ministry in this small, quiet voice that obviously I now know is the Holy Spirit speaking to me, I ran in the opposite direction. And I tried all sorts of stuff. I tried the college lifestyle, I tried the military, I tried criminal justice, I tried higher education, and guess what happened at the end of all of those things? Do you think I was super fulfilled and happy with who I was? <laughs> Good guess. No. I was wrestling with this call. I was struggling because I thought my attention was supposed to be focused on myself. That's what the world had told me. But instead, that still quiet voice of the Holy Spirit was calling me to focus not on what I wanted for me, but on denying what I wanted and for following him. And, and I'll never forget when the realization hit me. Right, the moment that I realized that there was only one thing getting in my way of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. You know what that one thing was? It was me. And maybe... Just maybe, that's the whole point of what Jesus is trying to say in denying ourselves. Point number two, being a resilient disciple means picking up your cross. Okay, so it's super hard to pick up your cross if you can't first deny yourself. And I think picking up your cross goes hand in hand with the denying of ourselves. I think what we can miss at times is the cross is an incredible symbol of hope and joy and redemption today, right? We, we put it on t-shirts, we get it tattooed, uh, we put it on bumper stickers, right? The cross is a symbol for us of hope, joy, and redemption. And I think that that's important. But what we have to remember is that in Christ's day, before his resurrection, the cross was not a symbol of hope or joy. The cross was a symbol of death and torture and misery in the most painful way possible at that time. I want you to imagine for a second in, in verse 24, if Jesus instead said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, walk on to death row, and follow me. Because I think we can miss what picking up our cross means. I think we can miss how extreme that call is. It's not a, a light recommendation. It's, it's a call to approach death head on. It's not a call to, to live a, a peaceful and, and active life. It's not a call to get, like we talked about, to sit on the sidelines. The world has called us to seek comfort above everything. Comfort, comfort, comfort. The act of pleasing yourself. And what happens is we end up choosing comfort over our calling. And what we have to understand is Christ calls us to suffer. Verses like 2 Timothy 2.12 that say, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Jesus will be persecuted. Christ's promise of self-denial is one that leads to persecution. And Again, not exactly the world's number one goal. And yet, if they hated Christ, how much will they hate you? If they persecuted Christ, how much more will they persecute you? Since we're talking about outside the circle, I want to introduce you to someone that most of you, uh, is, this person is probably outside of your, your circle. And this person is Perpetua. So I want you to put your, your time machines on. We are going back to the early 200s AD to the city of Carthage. And at this time, right, Carthage is a Roman province. Okay, it's under Roman control, under Roman governance. And even then, there are still uh, people living in Carthage 
who are of nobility, right? They, they've got the money, they've got the influence, the social status, everything that you could want as a 200s AD noble person. Perpetua was born into one of these families, right? She was born into wealth and privilege. She had everything she could ever want, but at age 22, she made a life-changing decision. And that decision was to follow Jesus Christ. And as part of that decision, right, we're talking about the early church. So she joined an early church, uh, a small group of believers, and they would gather together and worship and, and learn and study and talk amongst one another. And they were making preparations to be baptized. But their time was cut short. Roman officials arrived at the church and arrested Perpetua and her group. Something we have to understand is that in Rome, it's totally cool. You can follow whatever God you want. Religious freedom, right? As long as you also worship the Roman pantheon. And so, Perpetua and her friends, being Christians, were a thorn in the side of Roman officials. They refused to offer any sacrifice to the Roman gods. And as a result, Perpetua was arrested with her friends and thrown into a gross, um, unkept Roman prison. Perpetua's family understood that to deny the Roman gods meant certain death. And so they showed up at the prison every day, begging her to just give up her faith in Jesus. Just Stop. It'll save your life. You have a newborn baby. You don't want to leave the baby behind. They need you. Your family needs you. We need you. Just stop believing in Jesus. It's recorded in Perpetua's journal. Her father came to visit her at prison, and, and he asked her, Perpetua, just, just turn away from your faith. You don't even have to stop following Jesus. You just have to follow Jesus and the Roman gods. Perpetua said, Father, do you see this container lying here? Is it a little pitcher, or is it something else? And her father, seeing the pitcher in her prison cell, said, it's a pitcher. Perpetua continued, can it be called by anything other than what it is? No, he responded. Perpetua replied, neither can I call myself anything than what I am, a Christian. And it was because of this choice to have faith over fear. It was because of this choice to pick up her cross and to deny herself that Perpetua and her friends were interrogated. They were beaten and tortured by Roman officials. And still they chose to follow Jesus. And from there, right, if you know anything about Roman culture, you've probably heard of the Colosseum. Not known for its super peaceful executions, okay, kind of known for being a place of bloodshed and violence, well, that's where Perpetua and her friends were sentenced to die. And so on, on the morning that they were to be executed, Perpetua and her friends were baptized in the prison because they had ministered to the prison guards to the point where the guards cared about these people. And it's recorded that as Perpetua and her friends, as, as the arena doors open and they are greeted by a crowd cheering and, and just ready as they jeer at them for their death, a violent, bloody death, Perpetua and her church are recorded as singing hymns and praises to God. As they enter into the arena, they're met with all sorts of trial. Wild bears, wild bulls, cheetahs, leopards, wolves, they rip these early Christians apart. And Perpetua, she was gravely wounded by one of them, but the animals wouldn't finish her off. And so the Roman officials who were over this execution sent in gladiators to finish the job, even with a blade against her throat. She chose not to take her faith back. Instead of choosing comfort or worldly freedom, Perpetua chose death in obedience to God. It's recorded that when asked by Roman officials during her interrogation why she wouldn't give her faith up, she said, I suffer what I'm suffering now, but then there will be another in me who will suffer for me because I am about to suffer 
for him. Being a resilient disciple, it means sacrificing what your flesh wants for who God is calling you to be. But the promise remains, whether it's in perpetuous time or our time. Our God is faithful. And that's the paradox, right? The world tells you to be happy, you need to follow yourself. You don't need to pick up a cross. But the reality is that denying ourselves is truly what allows us to be fulfilled and joyful, resilient disciples. Even in the face of persecution and death, resilient disciples, we are called to carry our cross and follow him. And that can be hard. We're talking about outside the circle. There's going to be environments and situations and circumstances that you might find yourself in that kind of feel like an arena or a prison cell or an interrogation. But the call is the same. To deny yourself, to pick up your cross, and to follow him. My last point for this morning Building resilient disciples means investing in others. What is the point of being a resilient disciple if you do not then go out and build resilient disciples? What difference does it make, right? If God gives us, we we constantly ask, you know, God provide, God give us the tools we need, give us the knowledge and the wisdom to have effective ministries. What good does it do if we don't use it? Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it'll be familiar to many of you Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, this thing, this this discipleship thing, is not like a Pharaoh's frequency card. We do have those, by the way, so if you don't have one, you should probably get one. Um, It's not like a punch card. You don't get it punched every time you come to church until you finally make it, right, and the end ticket is your way into heaven. Christianity, it's not a hobby. It's not like a part-time gig. You don't list it as one of your special interests on a job application. If you truly want to build disciples, then you have to understand something. And, And this is something that I have learned in my time As a youth pastor, people outside of your circle are begging for meaning. They're begging for purpose and direction. They're begging for someone who is bigger than them, who who is faithful, who is good, who is holy. And as people who are resilient disciples, we have to understand that it's our role to help show them the Jesus that we believe in. You see, I think what we run into is this idea that it's just my job to do it, right? Or it's Pastor Sean's job, or our ministry team's job, right? We're the ministers, right? We got it. We'll take care of it. You have to understand that the whole goal of our ministry team is equipping you to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Because we can't build the disciples all on our own right? It takes time. It takes investment. It takes giftings. It takes passions. And if we continue to treat church as just a Sunday event, if we continue to see that 24% of Christians are regularly attending church, where does that leave the rest? I think it's time that we get involved. I think it's time that we start serving that we come alongside one another, that we teach and we evangelize and we raise up the next generation of believers. I, this is something I found. Do you know the difference between a disciple and a convert in Christianity? It's investment. The difference between making disciples and just being a convert factory is discipleship. And maybe it's time we consider investing in those outside of our circle instead of getting so caught up in everything that happens inside. As Josiah comes out and plays the keys, I'd like to close with this. Do you want to know what being and building disciples looks like? Summer Camp 2023 is right around the corner. Yes, sorry, Epic Week. My bad, guys. I apologize. 
Uh, so our high schoolers, I gave them a challenge, right? If they hit 100 signups for summer camp, they could shave my beard at summer camp. In a few weeks, when you see a sad short guy walking around <laughs> that doesn't have a beard, you will know that they hit that mark, okay? But that's besides the point, right? I, I, this is a spoiler alert for some of you. It's not everyone's idea of a fun time to go hang out with teenagers for a week and play ultimate cow tongue frisbee, okay? Not everyone's. And yet, 45 adults in this congregation from different backgrounds, different ages, they're from different career paths, from, from all over this city, have decided to volunteer their time to, to give up time at home with family, to give up time at work where they could be earning their paycheck or, or just hanging out and enjoying summer. 45 of them have chosen to invest in our students. They're coming to camp with us to help us in creating a Christ-centered, life-changing summer camp for over 200 students. And it doesn't stop there, right? The grads that you saw on the stage, they're coming with us. But this year, they're not just coming as participants. Our graduates are leading worship. They've planned it, they've practiced it, and now they're going to go lead. They're leading media and tech. They're doing all of those things. Because they understand what resilient discipleship looks like. And you have played a part in teaching them that. And so for those of you in the room who have poured in and invested, I want to say thank you. Discipleship, resiliency is not a one and done. It doesn't just happen all at once. It is built over time. Through those who are willing to be resilient disciples themselves. Proverbs 22.6 says, Start children off in the way they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. I thank you so much for investing in students. Because the people that you've invested into outside of your circle have blessed our ministry. But if you are sitting here and you are not investing outside of your circle, if you are not being and building resilient disciples, then my challenge to you is this. What are you waiting on? Is it a person that you're afraid to minister to? Is it that it's scary outside of your circle? Whatever it is, the reality of discipleship is that we are called to be and build through denying ourselves, picking up our cross, and following Jesus. Because when this is all over, and our time here is done. I want every person in this room to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for this Sunday as we celebrate grads and we, we look forward to upgrade in the excitement of summer, God. But I just pray that you would continue to speak to us about discipleship. Continue to reveal to us what it means to be resilient disciples so that we can both be and build the church, your church, God. Jesus, we love you. We worship you with everything we have. And it's in your name we go. Amen. Thank you. Woo